Before we move forward, I just want to tell you, this list is impossible. It literally is impossible. How can we encompass 10 years worth of heavy metal music with just 10 albums? It is an absolute absurdity. The 2000s, much like any other decade that heavy metal has been around, have delivered so many classic releases. There's no way that the 10 that I'm going to list in this uh, very format but it's going to be the same as yours. And if it is, it's some sort of strange cosmic anomaly, either that or you're some sort of super fan that jacks off to everything that I do. In which case, that's a little weird. We need to talk about our relationship. But at any rate, the 2000s were a fantastic decade for heavy metal, of course, one of many. However, it was the landmark albums that we were able to witness and be part of that certainly gave this decade the reputation that it certainly carries forward here in the 20 teens and moving forward throughout the remainder of heavy metal's history. Somehow, some way, I assembled 10 albums that for me I felt were the best of the 2000s. Of course, we're going to have some big time differences, but I'm going to present these to you right now. Let me know if you agree or disagree, or just post your darn lists down in the comments below while you're listening to mine. So here are the top 10 metal albums of the 2000s, at least in my opinion. Number 10 is Communic with Waves of Visual Decay. This one's kind of odd considering their debut, Conspiracy of Mind, was an album of the year for me. And this was the album that followed it up the very next year, and it didn't get album of the year. But then why is this one on the list and not Conspiracy of it? It's really, really confusing. It's has something to do with the balance of the years. Uh, this one had a lot more competition in 2006, and it was also the album that I think Communic started to take their uh, power progressive uh, sound and really just amp it up to 11. This is a band that's able to combine all the best elements of groups such as Opeth and Nevermore and present it in a way that is just really easy on the ears. This is not so much easy listening, you know, by the bare definition of the term, but this is an album that you can turn on and you do not want to turn off. And Communic has a discography that is very much the same, so they are a band that you should certainly check out if you have not yet. But Waves of Visual Decay still to this day feels like their magnum opus, the uh, album where the band was just rocking at absolute full volume and full tilt boogie. The songwriting is fantastic, and just the overall flow of the album is just magnificent. Number nine, we have Green Carnation with Light of Day, Day of Darkness. What can you say about an album that's one track, 60 minutes, and three seconds long? Well, you can say that it damn sure better be a heck of an experience. Now, in 2017, of course, we had Mirror Reaper by Bellwitch, and that was a tremendous experience. In the 1990s, we had Dope Smoker by Sleep, and that was certainly an experience. But this is an undertaking, a phenomenal album, one that certainly has a lot of influence from the conceptual releases that you got from the past, not to mention also the idea that heavy metal is an open canvas and you can basically write about anything that you want. It, it's almost like the modern symphony, and this is what Light of Day, Day of Darkness really kind of feels like. It feels like a metal symphony, one that definitely has a real pattern to it, but it's not something that feels like it stays very stagnant or it gets very stagnant. Instead, it's very lively. It has a ton of different options to it. This is not something that sticks with one idea or one riff for 10 to 20 minutes and, and you know, sort of expects you just to follow along at home. This is instead what it would feel, uh, feel like if a full album was actually just one track as opposed to eight or nine different songs. This is one that follows a direct story and involves a past member of Emperor, so the musicality and the overall songwriting prowess are not really anything to be all of that surprised about considering uh, that band is just phenomenal. This is just a great experience. If you've listened to Dope Smoker and you've listened to Mirror Reaper uh, by uh, Bell Witch last year, this is definitely meeting a bit in the middle. It's progressive metal that has a little bit of that extreme philosophy from time to time. You need to scope this one out. You need to give it that listen. If you're a, a fan of lengthier songs, it may change your life. Number eight, we have Arcturus with the Sham Mirrors. Now, these spaced out heavy metal veterans that have, you know, they have influenced, not to mention members from groups such as Demon Board Gear and Porknagar and Oliver and all of these great names that, of course, these days are almost synonymous with greatness. But with Arcturus, this pet project has definitely delivered one of the best albums of the 2000s, considering it just felt so ahead of its time. This was a bit avant-garde, a bit just spacey, it had just this weird atmosphere, this weird vibe to it that was one of its kind, and gave it a real unique ability. 
The funny thing is, is that in that particular year, this couldn't even be an album of the year, considering of another heavy hitter that was released right alongside of it. But take a listen to a track such as Nightmare Heaven or Radical Cuts, or you're going to immediately be thrust into this strange environment where you're on some doomed space station, and this is the swirling madness that is sort of building and clouding around your head. Absolutely phenomenal stuff from a great band. Number seven, we have Edge of Sanity with Crimson 2. That's right, a sequel. A sequel is one of the best albums of the 2000s. And it's not Operation Mindcrime 2 because that was a genuine disappointment. No, instead it's Crimson 2. Crimson 1 comes along in the 1990s as one of the most influential albums of all time. And then they release a sequel, of, you know, a decade or so later, or maybe a little bit less later, and it's just as influential. Somehow, some way, they're able to channel all of that energy from the first one and, put, and place it right back in the second one, and it, it... Wow. Part of me thinks there's a conspiracy here. Part of me thinks that the conspiracy was is that after the release of Crimson 1, Mike Acker Fitz and Dan Swano, they just decided to crank out Crimson 2. And they said to themselves, you know what? Let's release the first one, the 40-minute track, you know, the one that's all in one. Let's see what happens there. This is kind of a gamble. So let's release that, see what happens, and if it you know, turns out all right, we'll release this one. And, well, Crimson 1 is an absolute classic, one that you absolutely cannot live without, and the same is true of Crimson 2. Should we really be surprised whenever it comes to the personnel? This was an album that was sort of based off of writing the book of progressive death metal, which is what Crimson 1 really was able to accomplish. It sort of wrote the rules and established the boundaries, whereas with Crimson 2, they studied those rules, they made those rules better. It was almost like a Vatican Council, where they had to update things and make things a little bit more pristine. You know, other bands were starting to incorporate some neat ideas, so they were able to incorporate that into their sound, which made it even better, which is so weird to even think. Man, this is such a bonkers good album. You need to scope it out. Number six is Orphan Land with Mabul. Now, this is one that, that, whenever it was released, felt very unique in the fact that it was taking a look at religion that was not really seen or, or heard prior. Of course, in heavy metal, you oftentimes associate that with being anti-religious, either that or a band such as, you know, Striper that is overly, you know, in your face about it. It was not one where you heard a lot about the countercultures or you heard a lot about other cultures unless of course they were a band from that area and oftentimes those lyrics were a bit disguised. Orphan Land was not afraid. Orphan Land was not afraid to go to jail for their music. You know, considering they hail from the Middle Eastern part of the uh, of the world, this was something that easily could have gotten them in a lot worse trouble than it did get them in. However, this was a trip, a journey, a tale of three different religions really coming together and the different challenges and different things that are faced really showcasing faith in a new way, which is absolutely incredible. Not to mention, take all of that away, this could have been an album about puppies and bubbles and it wouldn't have mattered because the music is absolutely brilliant. It is wonderfully constructed and brilliantly reflected. The band is just absolutely phenomenal. Take a listen to their brand new album from this year, and you'll understand exactly what I mean, considering they've continued to pump out classics ever since, including the equally miraculous never-ending way of War Warrior, which came at the turn of the decade. Number five, we have Celtic Frost with Monotheist. Now, we know that Celtic Frost was critical whenever it came to early extreme metal, but did we know that they were going to release such a dark and brooding and just destructive emotional album with Monotheist in the latter portions of the 2000s. I don't think any of us saw this coming, and it was an absolute trip, not to mention something that really revamped that idea of how you can craft an extreme metal album. It doesn't necessarily need to have riffs that are flowing at a thousand miles a minute. This is instead one that is very simple whenever it comes to overall construction. It's one that has construction that almost could feel like a Doom album that was then sort of displaced into extreme metal, that was then sort of displaced into really just dark, dark metal. The brooding lyricism of Warrior, the absolute thrust into dismay and abyss that this album's music takes you on. I mean, this is an experience all the, by, you know, by itself. And really, whenever you take a listen, if you are a fan of Trypticon, which is, of course, Warrior's new project, this is essentially a continuation of Celtic Frost's Monotheist. This is essentially what the next Celtic Frost albums would have been had that band stayed together. That is some power. 
Number four, Porcupine Tree with Fear of a Blank Planet. Easily the best Porcupine Tree album, I say now, but of course we'll get to them later. But this is one that had absolutely everything that a progressive metal fan could ask for. It had a great sense of construction. It had a long-term, 17-minute long track, smack dab in the middle. That is probably the best song on the album, not to mention their entire discography in three parts. It's just an amazing, amazing release. And this is a track that uh, really could sell the band to just about anybody. And I'm sure sold the band on many, many people because this was a track I saw shared quite a bit and it's played, uh, was played a lot during their last performances as a band before Stephen Wilson embarked on his solo career. Usually the second half, or the second third, should I say, of uh, Anastasia was what was played. But the rest of the album is no slouch either. Everything here has a unique atmosphere to it, tackles a lot of different aspects of the world today, uh, and, and, well, really at that time, but still, these are some things that still affect us today, you know, talking about the dangers of the online or the machine sort of taking over, you know, the whole idea that we're addicted to our phones, and then the whole idea of prescription drugs, either that, or lost loves, or depression, or this or that, there's so many things that are tackled uh, from a uh, demologic perspective, which I don't even know that's a word, but who cares, it is now, sucker! Uh, the themes that are tackled here were very relatable. Not to mention the album is beautiful, it's sprawling, it's amazing, the flow is great. Listen to this album today, just do that, please. If you do anything, do that. Number three, Opeth with Blackwater Park. What a gift that we got at the beginning portion of this decade, am I right? Oh my god, what a terrific album. If Crimson by Edge of Sanity was writing the book on what progressive death metal was, Opeth was the band that basically said, well, I like that book, but I kind of want to add this to it. And then they release easily one of the most well-known uh, albums of the genre or the subgenre, whichever way you want to go with it, uh, of all time. I, I don't know if there's going to be many bands that are going to be able to compete with this, let alone uh, get an album out that is able to sort of compare to this. Now, of course, my personal philosophy is I think that Still Life, the predecessor to Blackwater Park, is just a wee bit better, but how can you really argue with tracks such as The Leper Affinity, The Drapery Falls, uh, and of course the title track, Blackwater Park? How can you argue with a track such as Patterns in the Ivy with its soft brilliance, or Harvest, which completely ignores and negates those death growls for a completely clean singing experience? Of course, that was heresy considering it was associated with death metal, but now it's something that you see done a little bit more often today, so the influence also is huge. Number two, we have Between the Buried and Me with Colors. This is a disc from a band that absolutely needs no introduction. This is an album, however, that takes that approach that you heard on a, uh, an album such as Light of Day, Day of Darkness, only split it up into different tracks. It flows together so nicely. This middle portion is absolutely absurd with tracks such as Ants in the Sky just going on this this like carnival merry-go-round ride and then white walls being one of the most furious and absolutely destructive songs that you're going to hear from a band of this variety probably ever i mean these this was never between the buried and me was not afraid to negotiate past that 10 minute mark this is whenever Between the Buried and Me was not afraid to take four or five different ideas and somehow string them together like some sort of strange, weird, you know, crossword puzzle or, you know, some strange, weird jigsaw puzzle. You know, they were going into the lab, as the hip-hop guys say, and they weren't just dropping beats. They dropped five or six different ideas and just said, well, okay, let's just put them all together and see what the hell happens. The result was absolute pure brilliance. Whenever this album was released in 2007, the game was changed. Now, some folks feel that the great Mr. Eft is better. We call those folks idiots. Actually, no, we don't. It's all musical opinion. But really, Colors is where we started to see that the creativity that Between the Buried and Me was harboring with albums such as Alaska before this one came out was going to come out in a big way and then they could go even further with it. But that brings us to number one, which is a tie. It's a tie from two albums of the same band, if you can believe that. Tagalog with the mantle and ashes against the grain. Now, of course, there's a massive argument about which one of these albums is more, uh, you know, is better or is more influential or is just the biggest and best experience that you can get from the band. Uh, personally, just buy them both. Just get them both right now. That's all that can be said. 
these are absolutely unique records in the heavy metal universe. And even though there are bands that are influenced by Agaloc, that have released albums thanks to Agaloc, they have not been able to really step up and compare to Agaloc. This is a brand new variety. This includes you know, some a little bit of black metal, a little bit of progressive metal, some Viking or heathen metal. This has atmospheric doom. This has so many different varieties. And because of that, Agaloc might be the band that was able to really make the idea of hybrid metal seem not only possible, but made it sound absolutely incredible. Like, this was the future of what heavy metal was all about. Basically drawing on elements from every different spectrum and giving it a home within song. Giving it a home within music. Sprawling passages from the mantle, such as In the Shadow of Our Pale Companion, which might be one of the best songs of all time, The Hawthorne Passage, which is nothing more than an instrumental but is wonderfully executed and just brilliantly builded, or, or built, should I say, builded, God. I can't even talk right whenever I talk about these records. They're that good. And then Ashes Against the Grain with its very snowy but also fiery atmosphere, a very uh, light versus dark dichotomy that goes on with falling snow, but then our fortress is burning. What a weird little way, a yin to the yang that happens with this album, considering it starts off, there's a lot of beauty, a lot of charm to it, but then when it ends, everything is on fire! Everything is going to hell in a handbasket! It's just another example as to how Agaloc was able to use tone, how they were able to use theme, and how they were able to use their own music in order to build something that felt otherworldly. And that's what these albums did. And that's why they're the two best metal albums of the 2000s, at least in my opinion. So I want to know your opinion. What was your list? Pop it down there in the comments below if you haven't already. Let's see how many we have in common. Probably not a lot. I'm Cover Killer Nation. I'll talk to you guys next time. Take care.